It's game day, and I can't even focus on independent reading. My mind keeps running to the field, to Principal Measley, to the other team, and if they'll be good and have more than one sub or a real goalie. I touch the soccer ball that Quinn painted on my face, and I can't stop puffing out my left cheek to feel it spread and crack. Ms. Blaze tells us it's time to find a good stopping place, and I'm two pages from the end of the chapter, so I try to pull my brain back to the book and keep reading about how Jess and his teacher went to Washington, D.C. to look at art, which I think is maybe a little weird. But Jess is having the best day ever, and since his dad thinks he shouldn't be drawing because he's a boy, I'm happy that Jess has Miss Edmonds to show him that art is for everyone. I don't make it to the end of the chapter before Ms. Blaze asks us to open up to our claim and evidence charts in our notebooks. I want you to add the name of a character or a person you're reading about, then one trait they have. Ms. Kravitz is kneeling down at our table and talking to Cece about a character in her book, and Ms. Blaze is helping Maddie, who's reading a nonfiction book about dolphins. Well, she whispers, Let's write down dolphins for the character. At the end of class, Ms. Kravitz tells us that we're going to be choosing a person or a character to write a paragraph about soon. We'll have a claim and use evidence to back up that idea. Some kids groan, and Ms. Blaze reminds us that using evidence to prove our claims, the things we believe, and being able to answer the question why are really powerful skills. I catch Maximilian's eye, and he gives me a thumbs up, and I'm thinking Ms. Blaze has no idea that we're expert evidence collectors already. As we're packing up, she passes a strip of paper to each of us with a sentence starter on it. Finish the sentence and hand it to me before you leave, she says. I straighten the strip out on my table. I know blank is a good book for me because... My mind is still hustling up the soccer field, imagining the plays and passes, and I have to work to make my brain finish the sentence. I write, I know Bridge to Terabithia is a good book for me because, when I'm reading it, I don't want to stop. It doesn't seem like such a big deal, but it is for me. Ms. Kravitz looks at my sentence and gives me a fist bump. That's great evidence. She says. Then she opens Bridge to Terabithia to where my bookmark is, thumbs a few pages ahead, and purses her lips. She takes a big, serious breath. The next time you're reading, she says, make sure you're in a cozy, safe place. I nod my head and remember what Cameron said about needing tissues for this book. Then she puts her hand on my shoulder and the bell rings. We all pack up, and Georgia and A link my arms, and we walk together to the water fountain before our next class, trying to stay hydrated for the game. Principal Measley is on the field before we are, and as soon as we open the big, heavy school door to walk out, he's already yelling at us to hurry up. We start running, duffel bags whacking our sides. The other team's bus is parked in the lot, and they're passing the ball on one side of the field and taking shots on goal. Their uniforms are maroon and white, and they all have matching curly maroon and white ribbons spilling from their ponytails. And I'll tell you one thing. If this had been two days ago, I would have laughed at those ribbons. But I'm thinking about A and her mom and a zillion other badass girls, so I just let them be and start scoping out their skills. We tie our cleats and pull up our socks, and even if our uniforms are old and baggy, I know our face-painted soccer balls look good. We jog our warm-up laps together, and Principal Measley leads us in stretches. Then he gives us a big lecture about defense. Contain, contain. Play it safe. Don't reach for the ball. Wait for it. If you get it, boot it as far as you can. A looks at me and rolls her eyes, because I'll tell you one thing, neither one of us has played the boot it tactic since first grade. The referee is calling for captains, and we look at Measley, because he never assigned a captain.
We'll take turns, I say. Today, it's no. Before Measley can say no because she's too sensitive to be a captain or something else ridiculous like that, Nell smiles and jogs to the midline. We take our spots on the bench, and Nell shakes hands with the other team's captain. Then she wins the coin toss, so we'll start with the ball. She jogs back and we give her high fives and put our hands in for our cheer. Then Principal Measley calls us out to the field in his 6-3-1 formation. Maximilian hands me the crumbly keeper gloves and I jog out to the goal. I can hear Measley calling out to the fans to remind them about his don't talk to me during games policy. I can get a little emotional, he announces, and laughs like he has some sort of inside joke with all the grown-ups. They don't laugh back with him. But I assure you, I know what I'm doing here. Nine winning years. I want to shout back that the boys are so winning this year, aren't they? But I bite my tongue in the back of my mouth and pull on the crumbly keeper gloves. Mom's got a camping chair set up on the sideline, and Wendell and Aunt Tam are here too. Grandma B is chatting with Maximilian's grandparents, and I can see A's mom and Georgia's aunt, and Emmy's mom and her boyfriend too. We line up the way Measley says, stacked up on defense like we don't have a chance of scoring. But before the whistle blows, we all look at each other and put up our index finger bullhorns and kick our hooves because we know this is some bullsharky and we're ready to charge. The whistle blows and Quinn taps it to A, who passes it back to Jamie. The other team's midfielders attack the ball, but Georgia is calling for it and pointing up the line. Jamie sends it to her and Georgia one touches it forward but there are two defenders on Quinn, and because she's our only forward, we lose the ball. Measley is yelling, What are you doing? Stay in position! Get back! My stomach drops, and my hands feel all clammy in these gloves because I don't want to let in a goal in the first two minutes. They complete two passes, but A knocks it out of bounds, and I can breathe again. Emmy intercepts their throw-in, and Cece, who's in her sweeper position starts clapping hard and making big gestures that say, push it up, push it up the field. Then she makes an overlapping run from the back past Fern in the midfield. She's still clapping her hands, and we're all shifting, shifting back to the positions we've practiced, to the places on the field where we know to look for each other. And when we get there, it's like we click into gear and can move as a team again. Measley is yelling, back, get back, do you listen? And I see Emmy's mom approach the bench, but Principal Measley reminds her, Not during the game. I see Maximilian jotting in the notebook, and I give mom a look like, We got this, because we do. And she nods. Cece has the ball and dribbles a few touches and sends it to Micah, who's pointing for it in the corner. And it's just like we practiced with Aunt Tam and A's mom. Micah carries it to the corner, cuts it back around a defender, and sends it far past where Kara is running, and A is hovering at the 18-yard line for support. I'm out at our own 18-yard line, clapping my gloves and seeing the whole field out in front of me. Our team pushing up and going to goal, and Principal Measley is screaming and waving his clipboard for me to get back. Have you lost your mind? That makes Mom and Wendell and some of the other fans whip their heads at him, and Mom yells that he better not say one more word about her daughter's mind. But they quickly look back at the field because the ball is sailing, and Kara is right there at the post to trap it off her chest and walk it in for a goal. I scream and run the length of the field, and Maximilian and Nell rush out from the bench, and we're all in a huge huddle falling over and holding each other up. The crowd is going wild, too, and when I look over, I see Ms. Blaze and Ms. Kravitz cheering, and Cece's little brother is running wildly up and down the sideline. Mom catches my eye and smiles and sends me a virtual Ember's Girls fist bump. Then she points to her heart and then up at the sky, and I know she's saying, I love you all the way up to the Care Bears. Principal Measley claps his hand against his clipboard and calls, Nice finish, Kara. Then I see him clench his teeth, and he calls, 
You got lucky, girls. You've got to hold your positions. Maximilian jots that in the notebook, and the referee calls for us to line back up. Tess hollers for Nell to come sub in, and Fern says she'll take a turn in goal. No, no, Principal Measley yells, and the referee raises her arms at him like, Make up your mind, hurry. Fern, you stay up. B, you're in goal. Nell, sit back down. I see Ms. Blaze and Ms. Kravitz and Mom and everyone watching him, and watching us, like this is a tennis match and not a soccer game. And I hear Cece's mom call out, Let the girls play! But it doesn't seem like Principal Measley is listening. I run up the field to meet Fern and give her the crumbly gloves, and I look right at Measley like, We got this. If you don't... But the whistle blows, and Jamie taps it up to Micah, and we're off again. Moving like a team, clapping and making runs and supporting each other back, and the crowd is right there with us, drowning out Measley's calls. Their team scores on a free kick, then A scores in the upper left-hand corner of the goal on a pass back from Jamie in the last three minutes of the game. After that goal, we huddle up and decide to pull a forward back and contain on defense. Lots of passing, Emmy says. Let's run down the clock. And when the end of game whistle blows, we scream and rush the midfield and jump together into a big blended heap. After we line up to high-five the other team and loosen our cleats and roll down our soccer socks, Measley pulls us to the middle of the field and gives us a big lecture about holding our positions and listening to him, and he's the coach, and he knows best, and how we got lucky this time, but he expects us to stay in our places. He holds up his clipboard, showing us the 6-3-1 with two sweepers and one forward. But we won! Quinn protests. And we pulled it back on defense when we needed it, Emmy says. Then Maximilian adds, it wasn't luck, and holds up our stats from the game. Us, shots on goal, eight. Them, shots on goal, four. Us, goals scored, two. Them, goals scored, one. Us, goals saved, three. Them, Goals saved. Six. Us, number of subs. Four. Them, number of subs. Eight. We just outplayed them today. Numbers don't lie. Principal Measley looks at the stats and says, The next game won't be the same. Quinn scoffs and says, You mean you already think we're going to lose? If you don't listen again, I would bet on it. I catch Maximilian's eye, and we all shake our heads and start walking back to the sideline where our families are waiting. Mom kisses me on my sweaty forehead. Your soccer ball is running, she says, swiping her finger through the smudged face paint. I'm proud of you. I'm proud of all of you. We turn toward the parking lot, and I mumble, I wish Principal Measley were proud. And the second I say it, I feel bad because he's a cruddy coach. But for some reason, I still want him to think I'm good. Mom stops and puts her hands on my shoulders. You, she says, looking right into my eyes, are something to be proud of. This team is something to be proud of. And you do not need that man to tell you that. And that feels just as good as the win. That night, I pull out Bridge to Terabithia and get comfortable under Mom's old comforter on my bed. I remember what Ms. Kravitz said about reading the next part in a safe place, and before I even start, my heart is beating fast like we're still in the last three minutes of the game and holding on together until the end. And then I read it, and my reaction is the same as Jess's. No! because it can't be true, and I haven't always been the best reader, so I think maybe I got it wrong, but I can't bear to go back and reread the sentences again, so I just close the book. It knocks the breath right out of my lungs and stings, stings like a soccer ball struck hard against cold skin, except eventually your breath comes back and the sting fades as you run it off, and the sting of a soccer ball 
never makes me cry. I hold the book and I cry, and I can't stop. I cry for Leslie and for Jess, and I feel a big, aching sadness, a huge, painful injury, a deep, deep loss, a loss I've never felt before and could never even imagine until now. And when I look down at the cover with watery eyes, I read the author's name, Catherine Patterson. And I'm mad. I want to yell at her, argue the call, get a red card, and get ejected from all this aching hurt. I'm mad at her for making me love them so much. It feels unfair, so I shake the book and pretend it's her. Why? But then I'm hugging the book again, hugging it hard, because it also feels like she looked me straight in the eyes and told me the truth and didn't lie to me with happy, perfect endings for everyone. My door clicks open. It's Bryce. And before I can shout at him to get the heck out, he says, You can borrow these guys. They help. I try to wipe my tears, but I can't because they're coming too fast. And in wiggle Dodger and Roscoe. Then my door closes again, and the dogs hop on my bed and circle around me and put their heads on my chest right where my tears are splashing big drops. I put my arms around them, and their heartbeats make mine slow, and I open the book again and read it all. About the building of bridges and the making of queens. And when I finish, I hold the dogs close to the ache in my chest. Then I return them to Bryce on the other side of my wall. 21. Principal Measley was wrong. We won the next game of the season. Then we tied one and lost one, which was enough to earn us a spot in the playoffs. The boys' team won a couple of games, but was knocked out in the first round because Kenny learned too late that he has to pass the ball to win. We're advancing to the semifinal round. Their streak is over. At school, Kenny and Morris try to blame their loss on us. Coach only gave us three practices a week. But before they can even finish their whiny thought, A puts up her hand like a stop sign. Don't even. And I say, he only gave us two and we're doing okay. That shuts them up pretty fast. I want to tell them that practices with Measley are actually cruddy, and maybe they should have quit complaining and organized better, or passed the ball to their teammates. But I just bite my tongue in the back of my mouth because we have games to win, and I don't have time for them. Now that the boys are out, we have to have practice every day with Principal Measley. But each day, we get more supervisors, too. He tried to tell them it was unnecessary now that he would be there every day. But A's mom responded, We appreciate being involved. They stand on the sideline during practice, and it feels pretty good. Like they're reminding Measley that they're there. For us. Plus, when he leaves at 4.30, we all stay until 5 to practice for real. Ms. Blaze and Ms. Kravitz still come sometimes, but we've also had Maximilian's grandma and Fern's uncle, Jamie's older brother, Quinn's stepdad, and Kara's big sister from her mentor program. Sometimes we have a whole bench of supervisors. And each game, we get more fans. Maximilian is keeping track in the notebook. Last game, Cameron and Tucker and Bryce came, and Maddie from class brought her two little brothers. Ms. R has come to the last three games, and Aunt Tam and Grandma B haven't missed one yet. And they're all coming to the next game, the semifinals, tomorrow. Wendell says he's going to leave work early today to supervise practice, even though I tell him he doesn't have to. But he says he wants to be there, and he will be there. And after school, when the bell rings and we rush to the field, he is. And so is Micah's mom and Cece's mom and Tess's dad. And when Principal Measley leaves at 4.30, we run drills with three forwards heading toward goal, making runs wide and covering each other back. Then at the end, we throw our hands in the middle for a cheer, supervisors and all. Maximilian packs up the balls, and I loosen my cleats, and Wendell says, See you at the condos. 
I look at him. Thanks, I say. Ever since I finished Bridge to Terabithia, I've been walking home with Maximilian along our tramped down path, and Wendell has picked me up there because that feeling of loss still sits heavy in my belly, right mixed in with all the sparking embers. And the last thing I need is Maximilian hustling through the woods alone to make it home before dark and tripping on a thick tree root, because all I can pick up on the walkie-talkie is static. Plus, it feels good to walk down our path together, past our perfect climbing tree, and out into the yards behind the condos, to go right in through his door and hear his grandma say, Mi casa es tu casa, and to hear Wendell's honk-honk and then climb in with him and drive home. When we get back to the house and open the door, I hear a baby crying. I drop my duffel, and Wendell drops the car keys, and we rush into the living room. Louise? Relax, relax, it's Cameron's. Then Cameron comes around the corner with a plastic baby, and Wendell and I can't help it. We start cracking up. It's not funny, Cameron says. The thing won't stop crying ever. The doll's onesie is unsnapped, and Cameron is sticking the key that's zip-tied to his wrist in the keyhole in the doll's back. I have to hold it for two minutes. If it stops crying, then great. If not, I have to click it to another position and hope that works. Wendell and I can't stop laughing, and we kind of get Mom going, too. And Bryce rushes downstairs, and even though he's laughing, he takes the baby from Cameron and holds it in the crook of his arm. Then he pulls Cameron over by the zip-tied key, shifts the baby to his shoulder, and puts the key gently into the baby's back. Cameron rolls his eyes and holds his arm still while Bryce rocks the doll. It doesn't care if you rock it like that, Cameron says. Then the baby stops crying, and Bryce smiles up at him and says, Maybe it does care. Cameron takes a deep breath, then tucks the doll under his arm and walks upstairs to his room, calling down, did you know the computer records how long the baby is held? I just want to put it down already. This is the worst project. Maybe it'll record that you're holding it in a headlock. Bryce calls upstairs. Then we hear Cameron's door close, and we all try to stop laughing, but we can't. Until Mom rubs her hand over her belly and says, The real baby is kicking, if anyone wants to feel. Wendell puts his cheek down and says, Give me a kick. And the baby does. And Wendell pretends to fall to the floor. Definitely an embers, I say, sitting next to Mom. And she gives me a secret embers girl's fist bump. Then Wendell goes to start dinner in the kitchen. And it's my turn to put my hand on Mom's belly. I wait for a kick and feel the baby dig its heel into my palm. I smile at Mom, and Bryce puts his hand in, too, and we wait for another kick together. And while we're sitting there like that, with our hands in, it feels a little like our team cheer. Then we get a kick, and we both jump a little. That's awesome, Bryce says. I think so, too, says Mom. At dinner, we all scooch a little closer and Mom sets up the high chair at the corner between Cameron and Wendell for the plastic baby. As soon as we sit down and Wendell scoops heaps of steaming spaghetti casserole on our plates, the baby starts crying. That's how it always goes, Wendell says, right when you sit down. Cameron picks the baby up and puts the key in its back, but it gets louder after two minutes, so he clicks it to the next position. I swear, every time I put it down, it starts crying. So, don't put it down, Mom answers. At first, we start laughing, but then we realize she's not kidding, and I picture her and Aunt Tam side by side, walking me through the night, laps and laps around the condo's backyard. Wendell chuckles, and he starts to say he'll never forget those days for any of his boys, but his voice is all shaky. The doll stops crying, and Cameron takes the key out of its back. He holds it for a minute and takes a few bites of spaghetti casserole over the doll's head. 
I mean, I know we did this when Bryce was a baby, but this thing's not even real. Tucker starts snickering. Remember Christmas Eve? They all laugh, even Bryce, because they must have told him this story a hundred times already. But I've never heard it. It was Bryce's first Christmas, so he was already ten months old. But he was getting teeth, and he just wouldn't sleep. Every time Dad would lay him down in his crib, he'd just start crying until he picked him up again. Cameron starts. Then Tucker says, But Cameron and I were worried that we wouldn't be sleeping when Santa came, and he'd skip our house because of that song. He sees you when you're sleeping. He knows when you're awake. We tried putting pillows over our heads and stuffing socks in our ears, but Bryce just kept wailing. Cameron continues. Then we heard Dad crying, too. Quiet cries, though. Not like Bryce. I was so tired. Wendell adds. His eyes are watery from laughing and remembering. They tell the rest of the story, and even though they're laughing, the story hits me deep down in that aching place, and it makes a lump rise up in my throat that makes it hard to swallow. Finally, Cameron and Tucker gave up on Santa and knocked on their dad's bedroom door and said they'd take a turn walking the baby. Bryce was already heavy by ten months, and it took them both to walk and rock him around and around their bedroom. But then I swear we heard jingle bells outside, Tucker says. Cameron nods, and my mom looks across the table at Wendell and smiles. Bryce finally fell asleep while his brothers walked and shushed, and then they counted on their fingers, one, two, three, and lay back in Cameron's bed with Bryce in their arms and slept. All three of them. And, says Tucker, our stockings were full in the morning. It was our first Christmas without Mom, Cameron says, but our first with Bryce. And just when Wendell is about to get all cry-snorty, the fake baby starts up again, and it cuts through that achy place and makes us all laugh a little. And I'm thinking that if the loss of a character from a book still sits hard in me, what kind of ache must live deep inside all the Valentines? After dinner, Mom runs downstairs and gets the baby front pack carrier that we picked up at a yard sale before we moved, and shows Cameron how to put it on and tighten the straps. It'll be a little big, but it'll free up your hands and the baby will still be held, she explains. Are babies really like this? Cameron asks. Like, they know how much they've been held and how long it takes for someone to pick them up when they start crying? Mom nods her head, and I'm wondering if that's true. If our hearts are like little computers that record when we've been held and soak up all the feelings around us and tick the seconds until we're picked up in safe arms. Arms like Wendell's. Arms like Cameron's and Tucker's. And Grandma B's and Mom's and Aunt Tam's. And I'm thinking that maybe having more players on your team is okay. And maybe it isn't an accident that the sign for team and the sign for family look the same. Big, wide circles holding everyone in. 22. Our semifinal game is at the other team's field, and they have fancy bleachers for the fans. Their side is full of people climbing the stairs and finding their seats, and even though it's a 20-minute drive, our side is full too. Ms. R., Ms. Blaze, and Ms. Kravitz are all here, and Wendell and Mom and Cameron, with the fake baby in the front pack carrier on his chest, and Tucker and Bryce and A's mom and Cece's family and Maximilian's grandparents and a hundred other people who are all cheering for us. When we get off the bus, A tells me that if we make it to the finals, her dad is coming from Brooklyn to watch. That's great, I say. But she just kind of shrugs like it's no big deal. The other team is warming up on one side of the field. When we played them in the regular season, we tied one to one. Kara scored the goal on a run from the midfield, just like Rose Lavelle in the World Cup final. 
The other team scored their goal from a wall pass around our defender and a strong finish into the corner of the net. They're good. But so are we. We're going back to a defensive lineup, Measley says. Two sweepers, one striker. We groan in protest, but he cuts us off and says, I got you this far, didn't I? Trust me. We all look around at each other, and I say, Um, no, we got us this far. Principal Measley looks up at me, then to A and Cece and Tess and Emmy, and around our whole circle. It's been an impressive season, he says. And for one minute, I'm thinking he really sees us. But then he starts listing off the same old defensive positions, and Maximilian hands me the cruddy goalie gloves. When the referee calls the captains for a coin toss, A points at Cece and pretends to flip a coin off her thumb. Cece smiles and runs out toward midfield. Principal Measley calls after her like she can hear him, and then he runs and puts his hand on her shoulder and shakes his head no. He waves A over instead but A signs no. The referee blows her whistle like, hurry up, and Measley waves Emmy over, but she signs no, too. She knows how to do a coin toss, Micah yells. Let her go. Cece gives him a good, hard glare, like he better quit looking down at her like that. Then she trots off to the midline to shake hands with the other team's captain. When the coin is in the air, she pats her head, and the referee nods and catches the coin. Heads. Cece turns to us and rotates both her hands in applause. Our team is starting with the ball. We do our cheer and run to our places on the field. All efforts on defense, Measley yells. Stay in position. And he means it, because the second Quinn sees an opening and makes a run, he yells at her. And the next time the ball goes out, he subs Nell in and pulls Quinn off the field. When you start listening, I hear him say. Then Micah tries to take the ball from one of their forwards, and she misses and hustles to recover back. But Principal Measley is calling, don't reach. Then he shakes his head and slaps his clipboard and yells, so slow. Maximilian jots it down, and there's a roar from the crowd. A big, fierce roar, because it seems like the better we get, the closer we get to the finals, the worse Principal Measley acts. Even the coach for the other team walks over to him, and the referee gives him a warning. Micah's mom is on her feet like she doesn't give a sharky about his don't-talk-to-me-during-the-game policy, and she's ready to go down there and give Measley a piece of her mind. Principal Measley subs Micah out and sends Quinn back in pointing his thick finger too close to her face as a warning to stay in position out there. He doesn't say anything to Micah when she reaches the sideline, just points to the bench. And there's a fire in my belly. Not just because he's yelling, but also because he isn't letting us play. He's not letting us try to recover and support each other. He's not letting us spread out and make runs and move together. As soon as someone steps out of line, he yanks them out, and we're all just playing flat defense and booting it out when we get a chance. Booting it to no one. Like we're scared. We are not scared. Mom gets up from her seat and walks down the steps and onto the sideline. Principal Measley sees her and nods like, Okay, okay, I see you. I'll tone it down. Then he waves his clipboard. Not during the game. Mom shakes her head, and I can see her biting her tongue in the back of her mouth, and I give her a look like, I got this. She puts her hands beneath her belly and waddles back up the stands. Nell tries to clear a ball after Measley yells, boot it, but it bounces back off one of their forwards, and their other forward follows it in and taps it around me and into the goal, and it's zero to one, and Principal Measley is shaking his head. All our families and teachers and classmates are telling us it's okay and we can do it. And they're right. We got this. But we can't win with him. So I call everyone in and we circle up, tight and locked, like the sign for team.
And I look at each one of them in the eyes, and I know deep down in the embers of my gut that we have to do something. Do something big so he can't keep yanking us out and pushing us back and telling us to quit reaching and quit running and quit moving forward together. Even if it costs us the game. Even if it costs us the season. I'm thinking of Mom and how she said that this team is something to be proud of. And I'm tired of waiting for Measley to realize that. Follow my lead, I say. And I take off my goalie gloves and walk to the bench. I sit down and I unlace my cleats. What are you doing? Measley says. Get out there. A sits next to me and unlaces her green diadoras and pulls down her soccer socks. Micah and Emmy and Jamie sit and pull their jerseys off over their heads to the t-shirts beneath. Principal Measley is clapping his hands in front of our faces like he's trying to wake us up. Come on, what are you doing? Our whole team is off the field, and the referee is blowing her whistle, and the fans are whispering and waiting. You have one minute to get lined up, or we call the game, the referee tells us, and the other team is all staring at us, hands on hips. I push my soccer socks down over my shin guards and look up at Measley. I'm not playing unless you leave. Me either, says A. What? He says. Get back out there. We'd rather forfeit than play for you. He shakes his head and taps his hand against his clipboard. I knew you were quitters. He mumbles. I point to the fence just beyond the bleachers. He looks up at the fans and takes a big, deep, dramatic breath, like he's going to calm down now. Then he smiles like everything is cool. Everything is not cool. Come on, girls, he says. And then it really is like one of those sports movies where everyone stands up until they get their team back because Cece points toward the fence too. Then Emmy and A and Micah and Maximilian and all 13 of us. And then some of the kids from our school start cheering. Clap, clap, clap. And even a few of the girls from the other team point toward the fence. And for a minute, it doesn't feel like we're opponents at all. You can't play without a coach. League rules, Measley says. And he looks at the referee who's jogging toward our sideline. She nods her head like that's true and blows her whistle and says loud enough for everyone to hear that she'll give us one more minute to take the field with a coach. Then... Aunt Tam stands up and says, I'm these girls' coach. And A's mom does too. And Ms. Blaze and Ms. Kravitz and Grandma B and Ms. R all say, me too. And before we know it, we have a hundred coaches and they all walk down and stand by us on the bench. The referee looks at Ms. Blaze's school employee ID and nods like that works for her and blows her whistle for the game to resume. We look up at Principal Measley, and he looks at us, and the fans in the stands. Then Aunt Tam steps toward him and nods for him to follow her. Come on, she says, and gestures toward the fence. Time to go. He takes one more glance at me, then A and Cece. We don't look away. Then he huffs a big breath, drops his clipboard, and follows Aunt Tam to the fence. When he gets there, he slams his back into it hard so the chain links rattle, and he crosses his arms over his chest. And the crowd goes wild. Aunt Tam leans into the fence next to Measley and gives me a look like, I got this, and I send her one right back. Then we lace up our cleats, pull together for a cheer, and run out to our positions as a team. Then we throw our bullhorns up and kick our hooves, and when we look up, all our coaches are pawing right along with us. A gives me a smile from center midfield, and I'm thinking it's probably good she moved from Brooklyn to Evergreen Road. The whistle blows, and Kara taps it up to Jamie, who dribbles it a couple of times and sends it to me. I'm looking up at who's there, and I see my team, making runs, getting open, clapping their hands, pointing to holes in the field. I hear them behind me, too. And when Quinn claps and loops a run around, I send it up and stay back for support, following her up the field. 
we're moving as a team again, and Nell is telling us to push it up, push it up the field. And I can see Principal Measley take a step from the fence like he's about to yell for us to stay back. But Aunt Tam steps up too and holds out her finger like, don't you dare. He shakes his head and sinks back into the fence. Grandma B is waving her arms toward goal. Go, go, she calls. A has the ball, and I'm running toward the 18-yard line. A defender approaches her fast, and I clap my hands and point. She sends a short pass, which I one-touch past the defender and right back to A's left foot. She dribbles once and shoots, and I think I hear Mom scream out a cheer before the ball even hits the back of the net. We rush A and scream and rotate our hands in applause. But when our huddle breaks and we're heading to line up again, I see Mom on the sideline, hunched over with her hand on the back of the bench, calling for Wendell in the stands, her other arm folded beneath her belly. Cameron and Tucker and Bryce are rushing down, and with my heart still beating fast from the goal, I run too, right off the field and to my mom. Tess subs in for me, and the game starts up, and Wendell holds Mom around the shoulders and says, It's okay. B, you stay. Play. Win. But when she takes a step toward the parking lot, I can see her water's broken. The baby's coming. Coming early. Wendell's voice shakes, and Bryce doesn't know what to do with his hands without Dodger and Roscoe to fill them. And Aunt Tam and Grandma B are telling Mom to breathe and that everything is going to be great. I'm coming, I say. And I look up at A on the field and A's mom on the sideline. And they look back at me like, we got this. They don't make Mom fill out any paperwork this time because every two minutes Mom doubles over and grunts and tries to breathe and squeezes Wendell's hand. And then it passes, and she straightens back up and huffs deep. She doesn't even protest when they give her a wheelchair and push her to a room. And she doesn't let go of Wendell's hand the whole time. Then we're all just standing there in the waiting room. Grandma B, Aunt Tam, Cameron and Tucker and Bryce and me. When the doll on Cameron's chest starts crying. The nurses look up, and Cameron tries to explain about his class. And they start laughing a little and say... Good luck with that. Cameron unsnaps the baby front pack carrier and puts the key in the doll's back. He walks and shushes, and I'm wondering what that little computer is recording. I'm watching him walking around like that, and even though he's almost six feet tall and has those long butterfly arms, I can see his toothless grin from that photo in Bryce's room and imagine him and Tucker walking and shushing their baby brother. The doll quiets, and Cameron takes the key out and straps the baby back in the front pack carrier, and Grandma B pats him on the shoulder, and then she starts laughing. Those big snorting laughs that are hard to stop, and her eyes are leaking little tears. This family, she starts, but she can't get it all out. I think I get what she's saying, though, because I start laughing, too. I think she means, of course the baby's coming early, and it's during B's big game, and we have a plastic doll crying in the waiting room, and six people, and this is all actually pretty calm because the pets aren't even here. Laughing so hard makes me cry too, and I'm glad for that because I actually just feel like crying and laughing is a good excuse. But really, I'm crying for mom and the baby and hoping this isn't too early and what that might mean. And I'm crying for Bridge to Terabithia, which I can't get out of my gut. And for the picture tucked in Bryce's notebook in his messy room on the other side of my wall. And because this year, we got a team. We made a team. And how it wasn't even hard to leave the field because Mom is my first teammate. And those 11 girls and Maximilian all have my back. Aunt Tam is laugh crying too, and she grabs my hand and pulls me close. And I lean my head into her shoulder as we walk circles and circles around the waiting room. I got you, little bee. And then we all wait, leaving no seats empty between us, slumped and leaning and holding and shushing and walking and walking and walking until we see Wendell. 
As soon as he sees us, he snorts once, then again, and his shoulders start to shake, and the ache in my belly twists as he cries. We rush to him, and he snorts and sobs, and then kind of laughs a little and sputters, There, okay, they're great. We all have to wash our hands up to our elbows, and when we go in, Mom is sitting up in a hospital bed with the baby asleep on her chest. We all kind of tiptoe through the door, but she waves us over, so we shuffle in fast and surround the bed, and Mom scooches up a little more and pulls the swaddle blanket down so we can see in. Two hours after we got here, and there she was, Mom says. Definitely in embers. I sit on the edge of the bed and look in at the baby. She is so tiny. Five pounds, eight ounces, which the nurses say is very good, considering she was early. She might be small, they say, but she's strong. The shot Mom got when she was here last must have helped the baby's lungs, because she doesn't have to go in one of those special plastic cribs to protect her and help her grow. But the doctor says she needs to have her skin on Mom's skin for as much of the day and night as possible. It's the best cardiorespiratory stability you can offer her, she says, which is basically fancy hospital words for saying that Mom can make the baby's heart and lungs stronger just by holding her close. Mom pulls me in and kisses the top of my head. Her name's Val, she says. Val Embers. She looks up at Wendell, who is starting to get snorty again. A blend, I think. Val for Valentine, and embers, sparky and glowing and ready to ignite, like us. Don't you love her? Mom asks. All the way up to the Care Bears, I tell her. Cameron takes the doll from his chest, wraps it in an extra sheet from the bottom of the hospital bed, and starts to take it to the bathroom. I'm not letting this thing start crying and wake up the real baby. Mom laughs and says it's okay, that this little girl will be growing up in a house full of voices and noises and emotions, so she better get used to it. But Cameron still swaddles the doll up tight, puts it in the shower stall in the bathroom, and closes the door. Val wakes up anyway and starts crying and wants milk. But even after that, she's still got her hands in little fists, wailing. So we all take turns, walking and shushing around the room. And when it's my turn, Wendell hands her to me, and she settles into the crook of my arm, and she feels even smaller than she looks. And I walk her and tell her a story about a zebra and a kitty cat and a fox and an iguana. And even though they don't all seem like they belong together, they build a fort and live each day in the magic of the forest. I walk her until she stops crying, and when the nurse comes to take her for a blood test, I give her a secret little Embers Girl's fist bump and a look that says, You got this. Wendell goes with the baby, and another nurse comes in to check my mom's temperature and give her a pill. You all must be Val's brothers and sister. I'm looking up at mom to see if she says, Well, half, or something else. But Tucker nods and says, Yeah, she's our sister. I nod, too, because there wasn't anything about holding Val that felt half. And Cameron and Tucker and Bryce feel like more than half, too. And not just because they added seven and we added two. And they don't feel step, either. Like they just stepped in as substitutes, or they're a step away from us. Maybe they're even starting to feel like brothers. I know for sure they're feeling like family. Like teammates. After the nurse takes mom's temperature and blood pressure, she says mom's okay to get up slowly from the bed to go check on how Val's blood test is going. I miss her already, mom says. And I know what she means because I do too. I hold the door open for mom and look across the hall into the nursery where the nurse is pricking Val's heel. The baby is crying her small face pressed into Wendell's chest, skin to skin beneath his unbuttoned shirt. He kisses the top of her head and opens his arm for Mom to sit next to them. 
Mom holds out her finger, and Val grabs on. Right then, the doll's muffled, mechanic cries make their way through the bathroom door, and Cameron rushes to pick it up and get the key in its back so its little computer will record that he was a good caregiver, not one who would wrap a baby in a sheet and leave it in a shower stall behind a closed door. He's walking the baby and trying a different position with the key, and we all get to laughing again. Grandma B pulls a pack of M&Ms from her purse and passes them around, then checks the messages on her phone. She plays one from Maximilian's grandma on speaker. We won. It was a late-game goal from Cece, who clapped her hands and pointed for Micah to send it through two defenders in the 18-yard box. Cece tapped it in the corner, and Principal Measley stayed by the fence the whole rest of the game. And we're headed to the finals tomorrow.